The only way we truly know who Jesus is as the Son of God and as our Redeemer, as our Lord and Master, is through revelation. This is In Good Faith, listening to first-person experiences of faith and belief. On In Good Faith, it's our privilege to hear stories and accounts from believers told in their own words. Our hope is to listen with an open heart, celebrating the power of faith and belief and what those stories mean to the ones who tell them. This week, I speak with Camille Frank Olson about Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the surprising amount of information we can glean from the few scriptures we have about Mary's childhood, her relationship with Joseph, and her position in Jewish society. Our interview is focused also on a moment unique in Scripture, when Mary and her cousin Elizabeth greet each other with love and witness. Camille Frank Olson is Professor Emeritus of Ancient Scripture and former department chair at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. Her areas of research are New Testament, general church doctrine, the life of Christ, and culture and history of the Bible. She has a Ph.D. in sociology of the Middle East, a master's in ancient Near Eastern studies, and her bachelor's was in education. She's married to Paul F. Olson. I think often we only see her after she gives birth to Jesus, and then she's kind of frozen in time as this young mother and not realizing she ages. She's having all kinds of experiences throughout the Savior's ministry, difficult ones probably, and is there after the resurrection among the 120 disciples I mentioned in Acts chapter 1. There are scriptural accounts. And then there's apocryphal accounts. And then there's sort of just legends of Mary as a girl and all this. How do you narrow down in this process what you're going to use? I think it's fascinating to look at the legends. I think it's fascinating to look at some of the apocryphal stuff. And a lot of these legends, Mary and, and the apocryphal works, Mary becomes much more of a legend herself, unreal, even divine, she truly does become divine in a lot of them and has led to a whole religious bent called Mariology, where you mm. worship Mary. And so I purposely stuck right with the scriptural canon. I think there is so much more there than we typically realize, and it is it can be trusted. Not only in the New Testament, but also Old Testament a little bit. You could maybe tease out of there. And the Book of Mormon is an incredible resource as well. So in Josephus, we get a mention of Jesus. But other than the scriptural accounts, as far as I know, there is no actual historical evidence yeah. of Mary, other than traditional places, for instance, Correct. in Nazareth, where she grew I, up. I'm not aware of any either. It came afterwards. So second century, it starts up. And so you get these incredible stories about what her birth was like, that she was immaculately conceived. and Without original sin. Yes. And her, her mother would not have been tainted with sin then when she conceived and gave birth to her. And she's fed by angels and mm. she's kept pure at the temple. Instead of what we can more likely surmise from what is in the scripture, that she grew up in little Nazareth, um, in a small village and knew her neighbors and was a typical little girl. And in the time, what would her prospects have been? What would her life have plan have been? Well, uh, arranged marriages, that was what happened. And, and they were arranged fairly young. We know from the Mishnah, which is the oral Jewish law that was finally written down in about 200 AD, that girls were considered a minor until age 12. But between the age of 12 and 12 and a half, definitely before 13, they were considered of marriageable age, which is just almost shocking to us. But the idea was to protect a young woman once she would reach her maturity with puberty, that she would be married so as not to ever be violated in any way and therefore lose her opportunity for marriage. So they married young. And she would have been with her parents, you know, her father would have been a major figure in her life. There is one Jewish philosopher, historian of first century named Philo. He lived in Alexandria, Egypt, and he wrote about Jewish young women and how they would be protected. But what he's talking about would be more the aristocracy. I mean, 
if you are living on a farm or you have family that you, you need to provide for, you don't sit some of the members of the family in a back room and keep them safe and protected there. No, you put them out to work and they're helping in the efforts there. That would likely be the area around Galilee. But she would have known the other kids in her neighborhood. We understand that Nazareth was quite a small village at the yes. time. How many, how many families I mean, or people? I mean, I've seen estimates about maybe 400 people would have lived there. This is the town where everybody knows everybody's business. Everyone knows everyone. <laughs> Remember when Jesus goes to the synagogue in Nazareth during his ministry and after he quotes from Isaiah 61 in first person, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And the people are just going, oh, they've never heard such gracious words. And then the first things out of their mouths is, isn't this Joseph's son? I think what they're thinking first off is, wait a minute, this is the Messiah. I mean, it, it just didn't fit. But they go, no, this is Joseph's son. Oh, no, Mary's his mother, and we know his brothers and his sisters. Oh, no, this couldn't be. They, they know everyone. And it was a shock to them to see what Jesus became. So let's go back to prophecies, because Matthew and others go to great pains to sort of point out that this event just fulfilled a previous prophecy. Matthew is the one that is a Jew writing to Jews, and he wants to show that Jesus is the fulfillment of these mm. prophecies. The most famous one, and one that Matthew draws on, is Isaiah seven fourteen. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Scholars have long come away with the idea that the translated virgin is actually in Hebrew a young woman, a maiden. Mm -hmm. And so in the context, it really looks like this is Isaiah telling King Ahaz, there's a sign that the Lord can give to you that Jerusalem is going to be okay. The Assyrians are not going to destroy it. A virgin shall conceive or a young maiden will conceive and bear a son and his name will be Emmanuel. In the context, it seems that sign had something to do with that particular time. But what's interesting, when the Septuagint was written, you know, this is... That's, couple, that's the Greek. A couple hundred years before Mary would and the New Testament events begin, they write it in Greek and they choose this word virgin, which is interesting instead of just a young maiden. And then when Matthew picks it up, he sees that connection that Mary is the fulfillment of that, that she is the virgin. So in many ways, it is Matthew looking at Old Testament prophecies and saying, this is happening right here. And he does it all through the gospel. This is the first one that he does it with. I mean, we just really get a few verses of this amazing announcement of the angel Gabriel to Mary she says, be it unto me, or I acquiesce to this, I accept this. And you know what I like it to say? I will go and do. <laughs> I think it's the same words as like Nephi said. Mm. Be it unto me according to thy will. I'll go and do what you ask me to do. And then her most obvious question is, but I see a problem here. <laughs> yes, there's not a man for me to conceive a child. There needs to be a man involved. She's engaged, as we call it, to... Joseph, but they are not living together. It's just the first part of that marriage. Mm -hmm. That's her question. That's what she's concerned about. I think it's interesting that Gabriel has said he will inherit the throne of David. She's not concerned about that. Don't you think that's interesting? I think there's a little hint there that there's some of that, that royal blood in Mary as well. With the genealogies, because yes. that was so important at yes. the time. And then we don't know how Joseph found out his betrothed is expecting. We don't really see a conversation between the two of them. So what can we extrapolate about what that situation was like for them? Because he had a really big choice to make. It's highly probable that they didn't really know each other. That same Mishnaic passage talking about a girl being ready for the bride chamber at 12 and a half or 13 talks about men at age 18 Perhaps an impression from that and other hints that he might have been older, but they didn't seem to know each other. He could have been coming from Bethlehem. Their families know each other. Again, we don't know. Their parents have made that agreement, and it's legal agreement. 
and to break that would require a divorce. I think it's so important that Mary doesn't tell Joseph what has happened. And Joseph simply knows... Because wouldn't that be your first thing? Yes. You're never going to believe me, but... Yes, yes. And I think somehow to just protect herself and the reputation and everything else. All that Joseph knows is that Mary is with child. And he's a good man. You can tell that. He doesn't want to publicly humiliate her. I mean, he could press charges and according to the law of Moses, even go as far as stoning. Mm. But he doesn't want to do that. He just wants to divorce her, put her away privately. I think with all of his goodness and all of his intentions, his understanding of what the law would allow and how serious this was that Mary was with child did not allow him to even contemplate the idea of still marrying her. Right. We skip over this in, I in the think, story. I think it's really a tough one. He's saying, okay, then I will. And it's not until then that he's ready to divorce her that he gets the revelation from Gabriel. In a dream. In a dream. Where this passage, this is Emmanuel, and that you should marry her, and that which she's carrying is holy. And Joseph follows that. He says, I will go and do as well. <laughs> I, I wish we had his background. I mean, what I prepared know. him to, to do this and say, okay. But we just see that he, he's called a just man. He's a ju- And he is. You can see that. And he is... Through all of this, even though we don't see him after Jesus is 12 years old, the assumption being that he may have passed away. I think it is an interesting insight into Mary later on, too. One of the four sons that we see Mary and Joseph have after Jesus is born, the first one is named James, and he is most often attributed as the author of the epistle of James. And I think it's so interesting in that epistle in chapter one, where we read his definition of true religion and undefiled is visiting the orphans, the fatherless and the widows. Mm. And I wonder, this is just looking at scripture and what we have there. If Joseph did indeed die when the children were young, perhaps James's first experience with witnessing true religion was the way his mother, a widow, And these orphan children or these fatherless children would have been treated. Interesting. Mary is told not only her own news, but she's told about this miracle for her relative Elizabeth. Yes. And and keep in mind what's going on. Remember, this is the way Luke introduces his gospel, not with the birth of Jesus Christ. He introduces it with the Annunciation and birth of John, which is a fascinating approach because Remember, Zacharias is struck dumb that he is not able to communicate after he receives the revelation in the temple that his wife, Elizabeth, well stricken in years, is going to conceive a child, a son, and his name will be John. But we just get this one little verse in Luke chapter 1, verse 24. Well, two verses I want to read. And after those days, his wife, Elizabeth, conceived and hid herself five months. I think that's typical for her age especially, but for being very cautious. And you didn't go out and announce to everyone when you find out you're pregnant, like today. They were much more modest about that and circumspect. She's five months She hid herself, but look what she is saying. I love this from Elizabeth. Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days whereon he looked upon me to take away my reproach among men. I think about how much Elizabeth must have suffered being blamed for not giving Zacharias a son. And he being a priest, very important for the son to carry on that lineage and tradition. So, So you go back and you say, Who knows that Elizabeth is pregnant at this time? Zacharias probably does, but he's not saying anything. And Elizabeth has hidden herself up. So here up in Nazareth, Gabriel tells Mary, you know, kind of like, how can this be? And she says, you go see your cousin Elizabeth, for she is with child. And that's when Mary says, behold, the handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. 
The angel departs, and she just that fast gets up, and she heads down to the hill country of Judea. Probably a little bit east of Jerusalem is the traditional place where Elizabeth and Zacharias lived. Mm. And she just meets this older woman. I mean, she knows her. I just think it's incredible. She salutes Elizabeth, and Elizabeth knows at that moment that Mary is with child. Now, Mary's just, she would not be showing in any way. There would be no outward sign of that. But Elizabeth knows, and she is, she's so in awe. She knows because her unborn son, right, John. She's she's already in the middle of the miracle. Oh, this is, I just think there is not the whole face of the earth at this time. There is not a spotlight shining brighter any place than on those two women. We sing in the in the Christmas hymn, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. It's revelation that is communicating. The spirit is working with them as John communicates. He's starting his mission very early. <laughs> Prenatal. <laughs> yes, yes. That she, that Mary is not only pregnant. And if it was just pregnant, can you imagine Elizabeth just kind of going, oh, Mary, this is not good. This is not a problem. But she's not shaming Mary. She's praising her and feeling so in awe because she knows not only Mary is pregnant, but she's pregnant with the Son of God. And Mary has not said one word except, hi, Elizabeth. And Elizabeth's words are fabulous when she says, how is it that thou, the mother of, not the Lord, but the mother of my Lord is come to me. She recognizes that this fruit of Mary's womb is the Redeemer. It's, it's really in a remarkable moment. And it underscores just how powerful the Spirit spoke to those two women at that time. That would be a conversation to, to behold. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> well, isn't it one of the longest interactions in the Scripture between two women? We do get, you know, um, some with Mary and Martha— Sarah and Hagar, Leah and Rachel, Naomi and Ruth. But truly, this one is, and and two different ages, you know, you just see the generations. You know what I think, one question that often comes up is, if Mary is descended from Judah, if she's the line of David, and we know very clearly that Elizabeth is the line of Levi, she's a daughter of Aaron. We learned that right at the beginning of Luke chapter 1 then how could they be cousins? How could they be related? And you know the word in Greek for this cousins, it's more related. It's not yes. like that we use the idea of... First and second Right. Cousins. So one of my colleagues, S. Kent Brown, I was talking to him about this one day, and he said, if you think of Mary's parents, and this is not scriptural, but one way that we could explain this... If one of them descended from Judah and one of them descended from Levi, maybe their mother was Elizabeth's sister, for example, that would make Jesus inheritor of both the priesthood lineage and the royal lineage. And he becomes truly the king of kings and the high priest of our profession. It's really quite lovely that way. Somehow they're related And in many ways, Elizabeth becomes like a mother figure for Mary. I think very important. Um, We don't know where Mary's mother is. We don't know if she's passed away. We forget sometimes how young people died back then. And so after this visit with Elizabeth, which we assume may have been some months even. Yes. It says three months. You know, she's ready to um, deliver And it sounds like in in Luke chapter 1, it sounds like Mary leaves right before Elizabeth gives birth. But I I just keep going back. Scripture is not necessarily written in chronological order. The idea was to bear witness of Christ. And so you could see him finish up this story with Mary and then going back to this story with Elizabeth and Zacharias. I think Mary was there when Elizabeth gave birth. That would be very helpful for her. So that would be three months that Mm. she would be there. And then she returned back up. And she arrives probably now, obviously, with child. 
Yes. So this is this is where Joseph yes. really has to make his decision. That's right. She's got to come. She's seen all this. She's been with this wonderful time with Elizabeth, and then she goes back up and has to face yeah. the consequences. So you can't help wonder, were people looking askance at Joseph and Mary like mm. yeah, that kind of yes. that kind of judgment perhaps? Yes. It doesn't, it doesn't say. But I'll tell you one that does say, and it's a little tiny hint. And it comes later. It's in the Gospel of John. John chapter 8. Get Jewish leaders here that are saying to Jesus, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me. Then they said unto him, We be not born of fornication. Now, I put the emphasis on the we. Mm. I don't know how they said it, but that makes sense to me. They're talking about being children of Abraham, and and he's our father. And then they say to Jesus, we be not children of fornication. We be not born of fornication. I think there's a hint there that there was something that had been dragged back through time. and, And not only would Jesus be struck with something like this, but even more so, Mary would have. Mm. Not only when she was pregnant, not only when she came back with this child, but through her life. Um, You wonder what kind of wagging tongues would say. Mm. So then they make their journey to Bethlehem where it's prophesied the Messiah will be born. In whatever circumstances of lodging, Mm -hmm. the traditional, it's all filled up, we're told, because of the census. And you know, we don't know if there was a midwife. We That's don't know right. Anything about that? That's this. right. We don't. But we know the critical, important things. And there is a reverence that seems to surround it as a result of it, doesn't it? But probably in some of the lowest circumstance. I mean, you just think of that in an area where animals had or would stay. We don't know if there were animals there at that particular time, but they had, but she lays that little baby in oh, a Oh, but manger. Camille, the song says the ox and dove. And the <laughs> it does. And it also says that Jesus, no crying he makes. And I kind of think, you know, that's not a sin to cry, I don't yeah. think. I think he could have cried. He grows up, because of Mary, I think, he grows up like a regular, typical boy that people would not think twice about who he is. Hmm. So we hear from the very beginning that Mary pondered these things Mm. in her heart. It sounds like she's not going, guys, if you only knew, like, I can't really say, but if you only. Boy, could she pack the arenas with Mary is speaking tonight, if you want to hear the memoir she could have written, Mm. right? No, I think to me, that is one of the most salient insights into Mary that we get twice in the book of Luke, that twice we read of her pondering these things and keeping them in her heart. Even from when they take Jesus as a baby to the temple and she's told a sword shall pierce your own heart also. Yeah, I I think, yeah, there's a lot happening. and, And there's, Mary is so amazing at such a young age at how wise she is. Um, She's obedient. And there's something, a connection I think you get between pondering and meditating and watching rather than speaking and always running to do and gaining insight and wisdom. And then when she does open her mouth to say, the Lord hath done great things unto his handmaid, and then she seems to go on to actually prophesy. Yes. My soul doth magnify the Lord. Yes. It is beautiful. And in many ways, it is her life that helps us see Jesus more clearly through that magnification. So he is born. We're told that he's wrapped in swaddling clothes, maybe not so unusual. No. And then laid in a manger, likely carved out of stone as the troughs were at the time. This was not a typical place to lay your baby. No. What I have heard is sometimes that they would, those who were charged with identifying firstborn lambs without blemish would wrap them and put them protectively in a trough or something Mm -hmm. like that. Have you heard that as well? Yes, I have. Um, Some would say that that's what the shepherds were doing and why they're watching their flocks at night, which would be a wonderful little piece to the story. So so 
here they are told by the angel, you should go up. You'll know the baby because no other baby is wrapped this way and lying in a stone box. And so they, they're able to testify of this lamb. Yeah, doesn't God. that tell you something about the shepherds? I mean, shepherds were a lower class occupation in the day and sometimes accused of theft and cheating. But I'll tell you, whoever these shepherds were, they seem, it seems like God chose some that he knew their hearts and they would understand and recognize spiritual promptings that that they would be open to receive that message from a choir of angels and then follow the instructions. And the way they reverence that baby when they come is further evidence as far as their own um, spirits. I, I think it's very powerful and beautiful that you get shepherds on one hand and then these magi, wise men that come with such elegant gifts that seem to say that th- from the entire spectrum, there are those that are welcome to come and worship and, and recognize who he is. It's not to a certain few. Yeah, she got witness after witness of other people witnessing of who her child was without her actually ever announcing it. That's right. Or anyone else. Now, you think about that. I think it's one of the most powerful parts of this story is that the only way anyone knew that Jesus was the Christ as a baby was through revelation. Simeon and Anna at the temple. Yes. The shepherds, the wise men show up. Um, Zacharias Uh. was told, Elizabeth, how she did, John the Baptist. It all was through revelation. And, And there is something in that that I think tells us today that the only way we truly know who Jesus is as the Son of God and as our Redeemer, as our Lord and Master, is through revelation. Thanks again to Camille Frank Olson. Her book, Mary, the Mother of Jesus, is available at Deseret Book. The episode was produced and edited by Heather Bigley. Thanks to Daniel Phillips for help with sound design. In Good Faith is committed to the idea that we all benefit from hearing people of widely varying backgrounds share their personal experience with faith and belief. In fact, we think people with such experience deserve some of our best listening. If you enjoy the show, be sure you leave a comment or a review where you get your podcasts. That helps spread the word. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at In Good Faith Pod and our Facebook page at In Good Faith Podcast. In Good Faith is a production of BYU Radio. I'm Stephen Cap Perry. I hope you join me again soon, right here in Good Faith.